Well, congregation, today we are starting on part eight of our series about the nature and character of God. And as always, before we get too far into things, we want to uh, thank, uh, give thanks to uh, Karen Sori, the creator of the Infographics Bible, for her permission to recreate this uh, particular graphic. And as we move into this particular graphic and look at it again, uh, you'll remember that that all of God's nature and character is within the context of love. On the, the outside, you can see that enveloping everything. And on the inside, at the heart of God, you can also see that there is the reality of his holiness and perfection. And those two things are there to sort of indicate that those, those pervade all of the character and nature of a God. God's eternalness, the reality <coughs> that God has always been, will always be. And this gets into really difficult territory because the reality is, is that we ourselves live inside of time. And so we, have, we don't even have language to talk about stuff that is beyond time. But yet, at the same time, we believe that God created time itself, and so he lives outside of time. But, but God, God is beyond time. But even words like eternal or everlasting, or beginning to end, they imply a time frame, which just doesn't apply to God. And so we're stuck. Our human language is insufficient to really grab hold of this concept of everlastingness. See, we can, we can sort of grasp the idea of God's omnipotence, the fact that he is able to do anything and everything. He has all power. I mean, we can't grasp the scope of what that means, but we can at least sort of have an idea that basically omnipotence means God can do anything, anything that's not logically self-inconsistent, right? God can do these things. Same with omnipresence. We, we will never experience it, but we can sort of grasp the idea that God is everywhere at once. We can also grasp the idea that God knows everything, omniscience. We can understand at least in part what that means. But everlastingness, we have not ever experienced that. No human being on this earth has. And the reality is, even when we are granted everlasting life, when we are raised from the dead and glorified in our new glorified bodies and live with Christ in the new heaven and the new earth, even then we will not really know what everlastingness is because we will have had a beginning. Whereas God has never had a beginning, he is the beginning. And weirdly, his being the beginning never had a start time. It always was. He always was. Well, anyways, we'll get into some of that a little bit more later, but first we need to look at the scriptures. So I would invite you to turn with me to Psalm 90. Psalm 90, this is the first psalm of book four of the psalms. This is a, a prayer of Moses. So many of the psalms were written by uh, by David. Uh, many of the psalms were written by the sons of Korah, um, and, uh, and some of the psalms were written uh, by, we don't know who, um, and other psalms were written by Moses. This is one of the ones uh, about uh, by the book, or by Moses. This is what the psalm says. 
Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were born, or, brought, or you brought forth the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn men back to dust, saying, Return to dust, O sons of men, for a thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by, or like a, a watch in the night. You sweep men away in the sleep of death. They are like the new grass of the morning. Though in the morning it springs up new, by evening it is dry and withered. We are consumed by your anger and terrified by your indignation. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. All our days pass. Under, away under your wrath. We finish our years with a moan. The length of our days is 70 years or 80, if we have the strength, yet their span is but trouble and sorrow, for they quickly pass and we fly away. Who knows the power of your anger, for your wrath is as great as the fear that is due you. Teach us to number our days aright, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Relent, O Lord, how long will it be? Have compassion on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love, that we may sing and for joy and be glad for all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you, have, as you have afflicted us, for as many years as we have seen trouble. May your deeds be shown to your servants, your splendor to your children. May the favor of the Lord our God rest upon us. Establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. The word of the Lord. Amen. Amen. You can probably understand a bit of the context of what Moses is talking about here. Moses' leadership of the people of Israel was just <laughs> surrounded and uh, enmeshed in trouble. There were, uh, there were brief flashes of brilliant obedience to God and many, many, many years of grumbling and complaining and the wrath of God being poured out upon an unrepentant and rebellious nation under Moses' care. And so, though we do not know the specific instance that Moses is sort of referring to or that, that prompted this particular psalm, we can certainly gather uh, a, a lot about uh, the context of where Moses is coming from. But the particular verse that we want to focus on today is verse, uh, excuse me, I skipped a page, <laughs> verse 2, before the mountains were born or you brought forth the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Let's talk a little bit more about what that means, because as much as it is true that we cannot really truly grasp what everlastingness is, um, we, we need to try so that we can truly put ourselves in the proper perspective a little bit later on. So let's begin this. Uh, scientists, and it, you know, it depends on who you talk to and so on, and, and uh, scientists say that the, the whole universe, our universe in which we live, is approximately 13, 14 billion years old-ish. That's a long time, a very long time. 
Uh, but even if you are a young earth creationist and you believe theologically speaking that the the, the whole earth, the whole world, the whole of creation is only uh, about 6,000 years old. That's still a long time, long enough for all of the generations of humanity that have ever existed uh, to, to be there, uh, at least as, you know, as far as that would work in the theological framework there. But that is whether it's 13 billion years or 6,000 years, makes no difference at all to God in terms of his own perspective on how long that has been. That's tough to understand. If you think about it this way, and I have used this as an illustration before, if you think about it this way, this book, this is the Bible, right? This book, the Bible, has a finite, a limited number of pages. And so if you turn to the very first page, you are clearly at the beginning of the book. You are also a certain percentage of the way through the book, depending on how uh, how many pages this particular in edition has, you are a certain number of pages into the book, a certain percentage of the way into the book. However, if our God lives forever, in other words, he has no beginning and no end, his existence is infinite, not finite, not limited, but infinite, has no beginning and no end, then if God's life were this book, God's life would be an infinitely large book as well. And if you were able to get to the first page of God's book of life, which you can't, but if you could, you would be an infinitesimal percentage away from the start of the book, an infinitesimal percentage into the book, there would still be pretty much as many pages after this page as there were before. And so if you turn to the middle of the book, I know this is mind bending, if you turn to the middle of the book, same too. There would be just as many, an infinite number of pages before this page and an infinite number of pages after this page. You, you see what I'm saying? In reality, there is no middle of God's life. There is no beginning of God's life. There is no end of God's life. It is infinite in all directions. So whether the universe is 13 billion years old or 6,000 years old, regardless, it is a tiny moat in terms of the existence of God, a nothing, a speck, not even a speck. The universe and all the time that it encompasses are nothing to God. He has no beginning and no end. Why is this important? And what does it tell us about God? Well, well, first of all, God's perspective is bound to be much bigger and smaller than ours. God is not only infinite in his lifespan, no beginning, no end, everlasting to everlasting, but God also knows everything. God has that omnipres omnipresence. He is everywhere. He has the omniscience, the omnipotence. He sees and has all that power. And so God can see everything where we, comparatively speaking, can see nothing. 
This is why when we read in the beginning of our worship service today, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who follow his precepts have good understanding. That is why that makes sense. Because God, God knows everything. God has seen everything. God has seen the future. God has seen the past. God has seen it all, and it is nothing compared to the eternity of his existence. And so for us, we need to remember that God's perspective is so much broader, so much wiser, so much more detailed, so much... so infinitely more than our perspective could ever be. And that for anyone or anything to set themselves up against God, who is from everlasting to everlasting, is foolishness of the highest degree. There, there is in certain religions, for example, the idea that somehow there is an equal amount of good and bad in the universe and that they sort of weigh out equally in the balance. But that, that is not true. <coughs> Even Satan, with all his powers and, and, and his might and his uh, experience and, and whatever length of years he has, he is, Satan himself is a drop in the bucket compared to who God is. Satan is as nothing. He knows nothing compares to God. He has experienced nothing compares to God. He can see nothing compares to God. He is less than a gnat compares to God. And this is true not only of Satan himself, but it is true of, of evil. God is good. God is love. God has existed forever and ever and everlasting, and he will be here long after evil has ceased to exist. There is, compared to God, evil too is just gone. Nothing. It is only because of God's great patience and his love and his mercy and his ability to see every last detail and his caring about those details as well as the big picture. It is only because of those things that God would even notice evil. God is holy and perfect, so yes, of course he notices evil. God knows everything, so yes, of course he notices evil. But compared to who God is, evil is nothing. And so too are we. Not that we are purely evil. No, I'm not saying that at all. We were created by God, and so God has given us good things as his creations, and in addition to that, if we are saved by God, we have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus, just like we celebrated in communion, and we are now pure and spotless before God. That being said, separately from that, we are, as Moses puts it, like the grass of the morning, the new grass of the morning, though in the morning it springs up new, by evening it is dry and withered. We too are gone like that. We too, even with everlasting life, eternal life given to us by Jesus Christ, we too will still, as mind-bendingly as this, as mind-bending as this may be, we too will be nothing compared to God. And so that's the number one thing we need to remember is who God is. God is no beginning, no end. God is everlasting to everlasting. God is omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient. God is all of these things. And we, in comparison, are so little. 
And this should humble us. And this should make us fear God, not in the sense of, oh, he's a big meanie, he's going to bully me, but in the sense of how awe-inspiringly, mind-numbingly significant and awesome is our God. If you are not afraid of a being whose life never ends, and yet who knows the hairs on your head, then you either have a screw loose, or you haven't really grasped the concept. So we need to remember who God is, and that helps to put us in the place of who we are just the grass of the morning. But then it also not only puts us uh, in that proper perspective, it also teaches us humility because we stand there and we say, like the psalmist says elsewhere, who is man that you are mindful of him? Why would God pay attention to us? Surely that ought to humble us. And so we remember who God is and who we are, and that humbles us. It should also encourage faith and trust in us. Because we know who God is, that God is this everlasting being who knows all and, and whose perspective sees us as, as tiny, almost nothings, and yet God cares, cares enough to redeem our lives through Jesus Christ, to send his very own son to live among us, a blink of the eye. God sends his son to live among us, and not only to live among us, but to become one of us and adopt us into his family. The God for whom we must be an eye blink adopts us as his children and his heirs, co-heirs with Christ, the Bible says. There's a beautiful picture from uh, Eastern, ancient Eastern Orthodoxy uh, in which the, the Trinity is pictured as seated around uh, a, like sort of a four-sided table. There's uh, like the father and the, or the father is at the head of the table and the son is here and the Holy Spirit is here and there is a blank spot with a chair there. And in that picture, Jesus is gesturing to indicate welcome. And all three persons of the Trinity are looking at us. We are the viewers of the picture. And God, in his triune nature, invites us to the table of his presence, to become part of his family. You and I, mere motes in the universe, adopted as sons and daughters of God. So, we remember who God is. It reminds us of who we are. We are humbled by what that means for us and that God would pay attention to us. But it also inspires faith and trust because we see the God who is everlasting inviting us through Jesus Christ into his presence where we can boldly approach the throne as sons and daughters of God. How could you not trust? A God like that. 
when you look at it that way, the circumstances of life, <laughs> and I know it's hard to hold on to this. I can't hold on to this conception of things very long at all. But when you look at things this way, the circumstances of life fade away to almost nothing. When God says he works all things to the good of those who love him, you kind of have to believe him because he is who he is. He is God, after all. If anyone is reliable, it's him. And so as we can hold on to this perspective that we are who we are and God who is who God is and God is from everlasting to everlasting, then we can truly rely on him. And we can put our faith and trust in him. And like Moses, we can freely plea our case before him and yet we can also trust in him that he will work it out. He will figure it out. It will be good. <clears throat> but what does it mean for us? Not only in our perspective and how we think, but what does it mean for how we ought to live? Well, it, it means a great deal because on the one hand, we are not everlasting, and we, we will never have the same kind of everlastingness as God. We will never uh, have no beginning. We all have a beginning, uh, unlike God, um, but we will have eternal life. God has promised that. Um, and so we will gain, as we go along, some modicum of perspective um, that may be more akin to God's, although his will always be infinitely more than ours. But we can see in God the reality that our perspective on life and its situations needs to be bigger than it often is. I wake up in the morning and one of the first questions that I ask my family members is, how did you sleep? I don't know. It was just always what we did in our family. And so I carry on that tradition. How did you sleep? Right? And, and we get various answers. I slept well. I slept poorly. Whatever. But it's interesting that that matters because it is such a temporary thing. It is such a fleeting thing. How did you sleep last night? Well, last night I slept well. The night before, not so well. It changes. And even if you have insomnia, that lasts for maybe weeks, maybe years, maybe decades, but it only lasts for some portion of your life. It is tiny. And, and yet those little things often define our existence for that day. I am grumpy, let's say, all day because I had a bad sleep the night before or whatever. I'm tired, I'm grumpy, I'm snapping at people, I'm being rude to people because I had a bad sleep. Get some perspective, right? Things didn't go well when I was repairing something. So, get some perspective. I had an argument with my wife last night. So, make it right and get some perspective. Right? The weather has been yucky or nice or whatever. We've been suffering from COVID-19 restrictions. Okay. So what? It's an opportunity for us to love. But we need to get perspective. We need to try to understand a little bit of God's eternal perspective and allow that to shape how we live. 
Jesus says to his followers, he tells them not to build up treasures on earth where rust and moths come and kill and destroy and, and so on. I'm paraphrasing badly, I know. But, but Jesus says, build up instead treasures for yourselves in heaven where nothing destroys. Our perspective needs to strive for the eternal too. I need to not let the mud of today hamper the love of eternity. Brothers and sisters, we will have troubles in this world. We do have troubles in this world. But they are a flash in the pan. An instant, a moment, an eye blink. Even if your troubles last all 120 years of your life on this earth, they are as nothing compared to the life you will have in Christ as a redeemed son and daughter of God, resurrected and in your glorified bodies, inheriting, co-inheriting the kingdom of God with Christ Jesus and so our perspective needs to strive for the eternal. Let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for our eternal salvation granted to us through Jesus Christ who came and became one of us, who lived and walked and talked with us, who died for us and who rose again for us, and who is right now living and sitting next to you, O oh Father in heaven, interceding for us and preparing a place for us. Thank you, O oh God that you who created and sustained this universe and any other universe that might exist or ever exist, uh, past, present, or future, that you who sustain all those things, that you who are beyond time, that you who has no beginning and has no end, that you would pay attention to us. Not only, oh God, thank you for paying attention to us, but thank you, oh God, for loving us for knowing intimately the hairs on our head, for caring for the sparrow and caring for the lily and caring for us. Help us, O oh God, to live with a more eternal perspective. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.